quote we know from the Testament is that that which was bitter to him turned into sweetness. That is one of this, the um, thesis, thesis sentences, if you will, key things for discernment of the Spirit of God. For living a life of continuous conversion. That which was bitter turned into sweetness because of an action of God of which he knew could only have been an action of God. Now that is the ordinary. You cannot tell me that at the end of every day of our lives we can't name something in that day where we did, said, heard, reacted, did not react, whatever, and only the grace of God could have enabled that to be which is reason for gratitude. Except then we have to stand still one, once in a while and reflect and sort of figure that out, you know? That's what we're missing. We quite don't, I'm talking, this is bi autobiographical right here. That's what we're missing. So this very first one, this, um, this leper is pretty well dressed, the way the Fortini does a powerful piece on this, dressed for death and had a bell but the interpretation that Joe Woods has given to this is that even in the leper, there was a marvelous self-gift for the sake of the community. That the leper um, obeyed, if you will. In obedience, there's freedom. Obeyed by the ringing of the bell so that others would not come close to the leper and get contaminated. In that extraordinary obedience, health was given to the, to the countryside, or at least in the form of a warning. I never ever thought of that before, but that is one of the reflections here. When you look, the, when you look at the Giotto print of this particular scene, they didn't quite do that here unless it's the one leg of the horse, but in the Giotto print, the horse is in adoration because the creature knew that the leper was the Christ. Francis didn't, but the creature did. The animal did. That's what, look at the Giotto print sometime. It's wonderful. The, the horse is an adoration. So the very first, and of course, why wouldn't you? The, again, lower left is the whole conversion moment for Francis of an extraordinary experience of grace. And then this is in two, two parts, this one. So you have the go repair my house scene, the second stage, if you will, of the crucifix. This, the next one, and these, these are typical, these are, this, there's no surprise, there's no surprise to see uh, these particular episodes, of course. But what we have here in the stripping of Francis, and the, the uh, too bad in some, well, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't talk to the artist, but I would like to have seen the, the cloak being put around him because of the ecclesial embrace of this movement, of this happening. But what, what's going on here, though, is that in the writings of Cholano, he tells us that, and the bishop realized that what he witnessed contained a mystery. What he witnessed here contained a mystery. The quote that I gave is from the rule of, uh, the first rule, rule 1221, that we should desire nothing except our creator, and then Francis goes on, nothing should come between us. I put that there because that is the vocational moment for Francis. Uh, the clarity that Francis had, however given to drama, the clarity that Francis had was that God had truly taken hold of his heart. Again, he didn't have a clue what that meant. He was a penitent, a penitent. He was stage one. He was the real first order, the penitents, yes. We'll talk about that with the historian sitting here. The first order of the Franciscans, the penitents. Anyway, we'll come to that later. We're talking mystery here. In the next scene, when we have um, that something like Claire, probably when Agnes came along, we have the opening of the gospel, and we all know the story of coming to, to the church and then needing the help of the priest to even interpret the gospel. But what, what's happening in this demonstration right here is there's already a companion. There's already this surprise element that the witness of his life is attracting someone. 
At the very top, there's this, the dream, the Spoleto dream about you do not have to go and serve other, other soldiers, other leaders of fortune. You don't have to have arms, the Spoleto dream, which again is going to sort of disillusion Francis. He's discombobulated by these dreams. He doesn't have the answers. I think that's important for us. We sometimes forget the conversion story took a few years. It, it, with all the drama and all the pieces, it, it still took a few years. And it took a lot of cave time, a lot of cave time. And wonderfully enough, it took a best friend. He always had a best friend in, in those days. As we move down then into the opening of the gospel, Francis did not do that alone. There is the heart of our charism. Francis is not standing in front of that gospel book alone. God had already spoken to other persons' hearts about this unusual event in the town of Assisi. And so we have the living a life according to the Holy Gospel. Again, that's no surprise that that would be the one selected. I'm going in reverse here putting them in instead of taking them out. <laughs> now here's a parallel scene. So obviously when the woman artist was commissioned, there were some deliberate choices here. As a d d definite parallel scene to Claire. So it's Francis's take though, all right, receiving Claire. And I chose the reflection here to be the letter of the faithful, which we're going to take next. Happy and blessed are you when you do these things and persevere in doing them since the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon you and make God's home and dwelling among you. You are the children of the Heavenly Father whose works you do. You are the spouses, the brothers, sisters, and mothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is one of the most precious mystical images that we have in the entire Episcopal of Francis and he gave it to the townspeople. He spoke it to the townspeople. At this point, that's what Claire is, a townsperson. She's, she's managed to run over the hills. There's her, there's her great uncle right there. Look at the friars, this is even the humor. So you're gonna get more humor now in, in the art because we can, first of all, we can read it clearer. But again, the, and Francis, well, I'm sure he didn't do that, but they have him holding up the cross of Christ, symbol again of the Paschal mystery of what Claire has entered into. And I think he's also cutting her hair with the other hand. <laughs> That's a little hard to do, you know that? <laughs> Especially left-handed. But it's going to be this welcoming. Uh, we already said that, though, that he would allow himself to be puzzled, utterly puzzled, with what in the world is he going to do now? Do you see his eyes? These are the only eyes that are pure white. Mm -hmm. Spiritual insight. Could yeah, oh, good. Uh, Jude just said his his is the only eyes that are pure white. Could that be a symbol of spiritual insight? Uh, trust me, we've only just begun in reading this. This is a new. Now we're moving around the tableau. You're holding the card there, okay? So now we've come up. We've come up from the left-hand side. We're going over the top. We've got Claire. Claire's a member now. And we're going to start to throw in some other episodes here. Give us a few other stories. What I chose for the quote here is definitely the mission message of Francis, chapter 16 of the rule. He gave two ways in which we could be in mission. Now, your founders or your, your constitution say that our entire life as a member is to be in mission. However, the Franciscan idea of mission has to do with relationships. It always will. We are in mission as soon as we put our two feet on the floor in the morning. We are in relationship. We're never not. You never retire from being Franciscan in mission. I think that's extraordinary, and I think it's different. I've been working very hard with reading keynote addresses and God only knows what from apostolic spirituality, from, from uh, LCWR and CMSM, which are the leadership of all the other congregations. They definitely speak of ministry different than we do. Definitely, no doubt about it. And it has to do with, with starting right here, chapter 16 of the rule. Plus also that we are to show our love by deeds. Francis says that in chapter 17 of the rule, show your love by deeds. But we're to proclaim, we are to, yeah, another word for subject could be reverence, that we should reverence every human creature 
for God's sake and wait on the Lord until it's time to proclaim. That is why that whole wonderful ecumenism, the whole dialogue with non-Christian religions is so important in the Franciscan family because we can see the face of Christ in every sister and brother. It's, it's, it's inc when it all gets broken open, it's, we're, the, we're the order of the new millennium. Sorry. Little. <laughs> slightly prejudiced. Definitely are the order. Best kept secret. <laughs> anyway, so this year, 1990, whenever this woman started painting, and whatever committee she met with, they said, that's got to be one of the scenes. you got to put the scene of Francis going to the Saracen. Now, what I like about this, one of these sort of best-kept secrets in the story, they think Francis had himself a grand old time talking about Sufi poetry with the Sultan. You know, I, I, I compare that to talk, going out somewhere and, and, and finding out there's a kindred spirit in the room who happens to like country western music. Well, that's all it takes. I mean, you could be talking, for me, I could be in the presence of a rocket scientist, and if I find out that person likes country western music, I let down my guard and I feel right at home. Aren't, is that not ordinary? Is that not the presence in the everyday? That's what, Francis charmed that sultan, and the sultan charmed Francis. It's the only way he got out of there with his head still on. But he did it, notice, he did it with relationship. I mean, nobody was more zealous for wanting to proclaim the gospel than Francis, but he, he waited on the Lord. He looked into the eyes and he saw another human being who genuinely believed in a God, it wasn't his God, but he genuinely believed, and in the expansiveness of his heart, he embraced him as his brother. Now there, and, and then he wrote it down later on. It got to be the code, the key, if you will, to mission, be subject, and then wait. That sultan was a white eye. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that sultan was noted as someone who had spiritual insight. That sultan was revered as a, as a person of spiritual insight. Thank you, Jude. Thank you. I told you, we've only just begun. We should come back a year later and spend the whole year just reading the, the, the tabula and see what happens. <laughs> now, now we've come across the gut. If you take a look at your card, we've gone across the gut. We've gone across the cord and the, and the, and the gospel book and the, the mark of the stigmata for Francis. And notice what's there, and it's totally out of chronological sync. It should not be there. But what is there is that story that we all love of Francis getting up in the middle of the night and having grapes with the starving novice and inviting the community to join them. He had to be a seven on the Enneagram. <laughs> wakes them up. Actually, he wasn't. He's a little too melancholy for that. But he wakes. He, he, first of all, this is, this is Riva Torto. Now, Riva Torto is on the way back from walking to Rome and getting that oral approval of the rule. So it's very early. It ought to be on. It, I keep wanting to point at the whole docile, and I can't. It ought to be on the left hand side of, of the docile, of the tavola. But it's not. So this woman artist, in talking to all the conventuals and everybody else, I hope a few more than just the conventuals, I can only hope that the, you know, the, the, there were lots of other Franciscans that were part of this discussion. It's one of our, we talked about this, we're going to, we're goals. But anyway, somebody said, when you come across the tablet and you go across the gut of Francis, the scene that needs to be there is the one that best represents the mission of Francis. What was the man all about? What the man was all about was when God gave me brothers. When God gave me brothers, show your love by deeds. And that kind of a, of a witness is going to bring about a proclamation that God is all good. It could, now, you want to talk about the simple. How many times in the course of our day is it the very little things that me meant the most? And in some ways, God's, God's invitation to us in the course of any day should not be denied. In the little things, the phone call, the card, the thank you, the checking in on, the special dessert, God only knows what. God only knows what, all right? But when the insight comes, that is definitely, I think, a visitation of the Spirit. And that is the building of Mel's kingdom. That's the building of the kingdom. There you go. That's the great. I mean, I think this is phenomenal. This, this, this one, and of course, Claire multiplying the loaves. That's good enough for me. I think I'd hang that in my bedroom. Just those two frames. Claire with the loaves, 
Francis with the grapes. Whoa, is that not Eucharist? Mm -hmm. Bread, wine. There you, there's a whole new set right there. You know? We've been used to seeing there's a whole new set for us. Claire multiplies the loaves. Francis gets up and shares grapes. Both cases for the sake of their sisters and their brothers. The little brothers. The poor ladies. That's the evangelical life right there in that one episode. It's what's going to count them. It is in terms of memory too. It very often is not how well we do something. It'll never be how well we do something because that's very temporary. I'm just wondering if the placement was placed there because it's an exact same place. It was. It goes across the gut. It's across the gut. See, it, see it's, it's going to be the most important thing. First of all, when you look at the, the, this gut, think of where the cord is on both of them, okay? When you go across the symbol uh, or the tall, the cord is actually print, painted on this in the, in the shape of a tall. You're going to go from, when God gave me brothers, there was no one to tell me what to do but to live according to the form of the Holy Gospel. So you're going to go with the sense of he, you know, he probably would have preferred to be on this journey by himself. We sort of know that. Like to be in a cave in a hermitage, like, come on, give me a break. You know, probably he would have. So brothers were a nuisance in the beginning. All right, like, this is not my idea, God. This is not what I had in mind, you know. So you have that, but it's gospel. And then you go across the cord, if you will, and what you have is getting up in the middle of the night and sharing with the, with the, with the starving novice. Yes? I think what's interesting, too, is that the parallel picture on the other side is Francis standing at the gospel with a new recruit. Yes. That's so, right, yes. So, you know, as you said, you know, the picture we're looking at now is him coming back with the approval of the new rule and many more brothers. Yes. And still serving the brothers, though. <laughs> it, you don't see him standing on the top of a mountain. You know, this lady, poverty is our cloister. They could easily have put that there. The whole world's waiting for this. Now, -uh. the whole world's waiting for me to get up in the middle of the night and have these grapes with this, this starving novice. Interesting. Real. Especially in light of today's theme in the presence of the ordinary, everyday graces. And that also, what I want to point out here, and I love this, um, this, this the Rivetorta story is that um, they stayed, it was the honeymoon part of the, t of the, uh, of the story, and that they're very cramped, and um, after a while, you know, it wasn't a good idea, they were a little too cramped. And the way Francis resolved that was to write the names of the brothers on the beams that were in the barn, so that they would at least have this much space to call their own. Now, I think in terms of the dignity of the human person, I think that is a beautiful, wonderful story. You know, the poverty could have been a bit better, and I certainly wouldn't choose it. <laughs> but the, 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 the tenderness, the sensitivity of Francis, that what, even though time, the, the space wasn't going to get enlarged, if they could claim a, and a, take nothing for your journey, you know, he who said you could possess nothing, in the very beginning of the, he carved the names on the beam, Maceo. Angelo, Leo, and it happens to be the names that you can read here, I guess if you get up close with this. The names that you can read on this present tavola are the names of the companions that are buried with Francis in Assisi. Except Jacoba, of course, is not there, but she will be. She sh so the, notice the beauty of the, the tenderness that we need our own space. The, the dignity of the individual is definitely, de again, not why that's such an important frame. This one will be no surprise to us. We could hardly um, not do the stigmata. Now, however, the choice in, in working with the artist again is to connect the whole incarnational theology with the whole redemption, with the whole uh, being saved by Christ. So the very top piece with the friars, not, never not with the companions. <laughs> You have Francis and the Greccio scene. Everyone loves the story, okay? Identity, identification with the humanity of Christ. So much so to have the print of the nails, which is going to lead us, and it does, it leads us right into the stigma to scene. The epitome of this lifelong quest, falling in love with God, to so wanting to be identified with God, as we know from the prayer, that I will feel the pain and bear the imprint of the nails. So, and again, though out of contemplation, and very important that these three companions are in this frame. Very, very important. The Paschal 
mystery that was lived in the vocation of Francis of Assisi was not without companions. And the very last one, and this again, the thought that must have gone into this is phenomenal. Wait till you see what's here. It's pretty obvious that the, the doves or the birds are in the form of a cross. You can see that going out into the, you know, they're flying off now, the spirit, to, you know, into the world, okay, into the world. Take a look at this one. Who knows who it is? I think this, we'll say that's Leo. That's only fair. Let's let this be Leo, okay? Whoever this might be, Bernard would be nice. The eyes of Bernard, the hand of Bernard is just, is, is, is sort of a gesture over to Claire. He is gesturing to Claire. His eyes are looking somewhat toward Claire. It's a little bit hard to tell, but as much toward Claire as anybody else in the picture. And the interpretation given is that he is saying, the friar, the companion is saying, Claire, it's yours to do. We've just lost our brother. You are the one who is the embodiment of the charism. You are the one that we're going to lean on, depend on. We need you. And she's holding the light. She's holding the candle. The candle was brought by uh, this I love. This is Lady Jacoba. Isn't it about time? Isn't it about time she showed up in some of our icons and some of our paintings? I mean, it took the, it took the 90s to do it. But here is Lady Jacoba holding her almond cakes. And the, and the delight of this, that in the death scene, you know, in the, the time of our life that we're most traumatized, at the death scene of a loved one, there is that little reminder of the humanity and the enjoyment of life that Francis received from his friends. So she's standing there in the death scene holding almond cakes, like for a party, thank you. It's this dear. And the candle that she brought, according to the writings, now she brought a candle. Well, the candle now is being held by Claire been passed over to Claire. And of course we have the visitation by the Pope, being anointed if you will, and the brothers looking on. That is, that's incredible. Uh, that makes you real happy that they did it in the 90s, you know, and not 800 years ago. So, and then the blessing that we all like, the blessing is in all of our documents, and, and whosoever shall observe these things, and so forth and so forth, then that's, that's from the Testament, but I, I chose that for that particular scene. Um, so that's what happens in, in modern times when you're going to make a choice. Is there anything, though, not there? Do you find anything missing that, from what you know of Francis, very dear to you? You know, how comes that didn't well, show up? Getting the rule approved. Okay, so instead of back at the at Ribatorto with the okay. The Wolf of Gubbio story. And certainly by 1990, we know we know it's a legend, but hey, that could have been there. We love that story. From both of them, uh, not the time when uh, Claire and Francis met in the valley. Oh, the and picnic. the villagers came rushing down to put out the fire. Yes. Because of the love. Yes, that would have been, you know, in the 90s, shame on her. That, that woman artist should have thought of that. There should have been, <laughs> there should have been an exchange. Friends. There should have been an episode which showed the exchange. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, whoa. <laughs> No, that, that, that's your that, that's your tavola. Okay, that's a perfect lead-in. Thank you for that. Because I'm going to ask you right now, if you wouldn't mind, and only, I'm only going to say for uh, no more than 10 minutes, five minutes reflection, five minutes sharing. Oh, my God, I think we can do this. I'm going to ask you to take a look at the cards that are, you have in front of you. And if you take a look at the left-hand side of both of them, of Francis and Claire, they are the story of our, of our call. They are the story of the times when we know we fell in love with God and that love took a different turn. And we made a choice and we said yes and we're still here. I would like you to think about in your albums, anywhere, in boxes, at home, maybe there are no albums, but somewhere in, in your memory, what would be the snapshot that would be on your tavola on the left hand side? Now you're standing in the middle, right? It's you. What would be the snapshot of the time that you fell in love with God and your Franciscan call was heard. And then one more snapshot. I could have said do eight, that we would hear for a whole week. <laughs> one more snapshot. We're going down the right hand side of the tavola. What is the time in mission? Now all of life is mission, all right? 
So we're not going to jump 26 years or 15 years. We're not going to do this. What is one of the times in mission when you had a keen sense of gratitude to God for allowing you to be part of that mission? A keen time when you just said thank you to God for what was happening in mission. And just as a little hint, it could have been while you were doing dishes. That's what we're talking about today. It does not have to be sometime when you were sent or proclaiming or on retreat. You could have been doing dishes. Okay. Bonaventure was doing dishes when they told him he was elected the minister general. So anyway, do you think is that all right with you? Five minutes to sort of just sort of, and then just turn to the person right or left and just sort of share that and then, then we'll... <laughs> Paul. <laughs> it must be that teacher's face. Now it's that you're a woman. Oh. <laughs> About time it paid off. <laughs> so that was good, huh? Yeah. I was thinking as I uh, just came back up here, wouldn't it be grand uh, this to do a, a portrait of your... Um, what is the woman, Armida Borelli? Have her and then take episodes of your, of eight of them. You know? <laughs> well, I, I even meant, I even meant from a photographer's viewpoint, like the real thing. Like take her and blow her up and stand her there and then you yourselves as a, as a, as an institute, as missionaries, you find the eight that you want in photographs around it. Wouldn't that be great? There you go. You know, Yes. Well, you know how they do storyboards for, for uh, different shows, plays, and, and cartoons? Yes. Yeah. Each of us could, in a sense, uh, sketch out our own storyboard. And yes, you could. I think, and I'd like to throw this challenge out to you. I have a couple challenges before the morning's over, but it's almost over. Uh, I think that um, it would be a, 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 even a good retreat experience for each of us to do our own tavola before we die anyway, you know, to, 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 to actually, to, you know. Before we die, but that, that's that eighth panel. That's the eighth, yeah, right, exactly right, exactly right, exactly right. Because I was thinking, I was thinking for Peter Borelli, the eighth panel's right up there, it's that, that, oh. that, that bed and uh, okay. dying of uh, okay. disease. Okay, and, uh, Okay. Now I don't want you to do Anita. Uh, uh, I don't want you to do uh, Amita. Would you, uh, uh, Amita Burrell. I don't want you to do her tavola. I want you to do the Institute's tavola. The uh, the mission. Yeah. Your charism tavola. Uh, she can be in the middle. That's fine. But then the story of your story of yourself. No, 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 no. She's dead. As Joe Kenichi would say, she's dead. We're alive. Um, but but do, do do the secular institute. Do the the missionaries of the kingship of Christ. No. Just find out what what episode anyway when you think about it when we go into prayer or take time apart or do anything like that we really need to be creative that creative piece very often is not dealt with when we step aside we should probably challenge ourselves that when we give God gives us the gift of, of quiet solitude companionship something creative will come out of it something all right some gesture Anyway, having said that, I'd like to end just this one section with just giving you a chance to be reflective. I'm going to put a beautiful song on that's written by an active poor Claire in uh, Dublin, in Ireland. It's tape that she's done. The words are right here for you. So it's just a little shift that we're going to do now. With You have the yellow paper. Everybody should have, everybody should have this. <coughs> No? Here you are, you can have mine. You may have to share. Uh, there should have been enough. They're, they're, they were given out. They're all given out, that's all I know. Okay.
along. Uh, there's a chapter in here, The Wisdom of the Pavarello by Eloy Leclerc. This is a precious, precious book and it's just been reprinted from the uh, Franciscan Press in Quincy. It used to be the Franciscan Herald Press. The chapter in here that uh, I would recommend to you among others, but it's called If We Know How to Adore. If We Only Know How to Adore. And it's, it's just a, a very um, insightful reflection very much out of the admonitions of Francis, helping us learn what to do with our heart so that we don't miss the opportunities to recognize the visitation of God in the daily. It's a story about Rufino. So if you get a chance, of, uh, the wisdom of the Pavarello, newly reprinted. So that says something about its demand. And the author? Eloy, E-L-O-I, Leclerc. L-E-C-L-E-R-C, Leclerc. Eloy, Eloy Leclerc, very fine. He has done also, if you're going to send for things, do, uh, the, uh, just left me, it's the Canticle of the Sun. Um, has the word dawn in the title and it's about the Canticle. It's excellent, it's, spiritual, it's a spiritual reading. He did the Canticle of the Creatures, which is a much more technical book. Uh, Song of the Dawn, there you go. Song of the Dawn, I would recommend that too by him. Also, return to the gospel while we're at it. Return to the gospel is his. Return, 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 return to the gospel. Return to the gospel. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. That's what? Oh, yeah, that just gave you three titles by Leclerc. Yeah. They would all be Quincy. Quincy. No, Quincy. University, yeah, uh, Quincy, Illinois. Illinois. Mm -hmm. I'm sure um, Jude has a couple books that would have the, that would at least have the, uh, you know, the address. The very... If anyone would like to order any of those through what we, if you're ordering tapes already, just put it on the list of tapes. I'll order them in, in bulk and we'll be able to supply them. This, uh, this very last section will not be long, but I wanted, I was quite taken with your documents, and I wanted to just, um, perhaps, just give you some reflection from who you are, uh, and in light of all of us, and together in the family. Uh, probably one of the best kept secrets is that who you are is very, very much a kinship and sister to the third order regular sisters and brothers. And I think that's one of the challenges I'd like to throw out to you today, is that to help us get to know you and for you to get to know us and us mutually to pay attention to the opportunities to do that. Um, 
So I'm going to invite us into why that's important just now. The opening of our new rule, 1982, which is an extraordinary document of God's spirit that was written internationally, internationally, first time, and was given the approval of the Holy Father for a rule, thank you, when we're not allowed to have any rules, you can only have four. We have a rule that we was done in 1982, and it's totally written in the words of Francis and Claire, something the Third Order Regular never had before. If you want to read some things that are as dry as dust, you read some of our rules through the past centuries. We finally got one with life, and that's why so much has happened among us and is happening. In the United States, there are 16,000 of us. And so I, I think we, we probably meet each other along the way very easily. The prologue to our rule is the same prologue as the secular Franciscan order has to their rule, which was done in 1978. And it comes from the what's called the Volterra letter. It's the letter to the faithful, an earlier edition, some people say that, an exhortation that Francis gave to the penitents. Now, we're not real thrilled with the word penitent, all right? In our community, 60 chapter delegates in 1982 refused to ratify the constitutions because some of us who were on the constitutions committee put categories according to chapters and it was called life in community in the order of penance and they said no thanks because <laughs> we hadn't done any homework we didn't do our homework you know we learned the hard way to do the homework about what does it mean to belong to the order of penance we belong everybody in this room to the order of penance this chapter this incredible little letter and they think it's probably something Francis preached and it got written down thank God and it was given to the people you know to the moms and the dads and the shopkeepers and the kids and the teenagers and all those folks that Francis mentions in chapter 23 of his rule because he never excluded anybody but in the letter after he invites us into this wholehearted living of the gospel all our, with, you know with all our heart all our mind all our soul he then tells us that we are in fact because we try to keep our heart open to the Spirit of God we are the mothers the brothers and sisters and the spouses of the Lord Jesus Christ that's in this letter and what is so precious about it is you know how sometimes people think oh well if you want to talk to the poor ladies because they're contemplatives and they're Eucharistic and they are before the Blessed Sacrament all the time and they'll understand all those images so let's let's t let's give them to them Francis was incapable of that kind of categorical thinking if you were a person open to the Spirit of God there was no reason in the world why in the depth of your being you wouldn't understand what it meant to be called a spouse or what it meant to be called a mother of the Lord or what it meant to be called a brother or sister of the Lord there's no way that he had these so-called degrees of perfection in his mentality so in your documents you talk about being salt and light and leaven salt and light and leaven and I'd like to, to just say to you that those th th they, they interface and this is sort of the take that I would put on that if you are to be salt then it means you are to be sister of the Lord and how is one sister I have to say sister are all women in this community this group, right? but in the, for the people in the room sister and brother of the Lord it is our entire meaning to be sister brother of the Lord Francis says is the one who wishes to do the will of the Father to do the will of the Father is to enter into a relationship of poverty sine propria of solidarity and poverty, you know, Francis says, the person is a thief who will not let go of the purse of their own opinion. You're a thief. So that's how incisive he is. That's how incisive he is when he talks about poverty. We could make the mistake of counting how many clothes we have, how much clothes we have in, in, in the closet. One of the reasons I don't wear earrings is because I, there wouldn't be a jewelry box big enough to keep up <laughs> with. I mean, we're allowed to do that. I just don't. I know myself too well. I mean, it's like, but we tend to do that with poverty. You know, we tend to count and measure. Francis went into the heart of the matter. Appropriate nothing to yourself, not even your own opinion. So that, that is the, that's the salt, thank you. You know, salt, we are to be, to, to be, if Claire says in her letter, you know, leaven puts salt into, into, into your choices that you make, decisions that you make, should be, there should be, um, life should be given it by salt. Well, the salt for the Franciscan is the name sister and brother. And so day in and day out, in doing the dishes and parking the car right and leaving some gas in it and, and all those little things that get under our skin called living the life, 
day in and day out, there's the salt, and then and salt loses its flavor. What will be, you know, what will happen? Okay, your images are powerful, extremely powerful, but they have a counterpart in our Franciscan language. Um, the whole part about, in a sense, what we believe about the Christ, we just came from a whole form. I'm not even going to get near that, except to say that the exalted on Holy Saturday has the church has sort of. I think messed us up. We sing that line about, oh happy fault that gave us so great a savior. Franciscans resound say, not, <laughs> not. Are we going to be grateful for the power of Satan, sin, whatever that was, to give us the greatest masterpiece of creation, the love of, the, of, the, of Christ? Is that, what we, is that what this thing's all about? That there never would have been the human person of Jesus Christ if there hadn't been sin? We say not. But when we say not, think about the implications of that in the way we view the world then. The lens that the Franciscan puts on the whole view of the world and the goodness of God and the goodness of a human person and the value of creation which is not to be dominated or exploited. Of, of, well, we're creation. The value of nature, we'll say. So there's a whole, there's a world in there, whole world in there, Canticle of the Sun, whole world, all right? But it is the reason why the word sister and brother is so extraordinarily precious to us. Now we're having a hard time with the word fraternity. A good old English language hasn't got a counterpart to it. We'll probably bury the word. We'll never use the word fraternity. It's going to be a shame, but we can't figure out what to say. Community is not the same. And even in the reaction that you just gave, so already says how at the core of our being as Franciscans, we understand something about that word fraternity. That is our salt. That is being sister, brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to do the will. I mean, and is there anything that calls to more conversion, continuous conversion, than being in relationship? I mean, really. You know, it isn't even being given an impossible task to do. It's being in relationship while we're doing that task. There's the salt. The second image that you love, you have in your work is light. And I see that especially after our sister Claire. That light, of course, would have to be that, that, that intimate relationship that we have with our God, which could be, is, could be the word spouse in the letter to the faithful. The, the unceasing prayer, in each place and every time and in all seasons, we are to have and keep in our heart. In each place, in all seasons, with every emotion, with all our affections, and every time and place. Unceasing prayer. Well, the only way that this unceasing prayer happens is, the, is I think, is, is the ordinary. We've fallen in love. At the end of the day, we would at least try to wonder where were we grateful? What did we even recognize reasons to be grateful? But truly, that is unceasing prayer. That is, there's not, it's not for a special pocket of time when we go, go away, you know. That's light. That's spouse doesn't get any better and it doesn't get any harder. It's nourished, has to be nourished. There's, we're human beings for heaven's sakes. Life in the fast lane gets a little old. Has to be nourished. So that's why we have the sacraments. It's why we have spiritual direction. It's why we have good friends. But each one of those things take time. And there's the discipline. Continuous conversion. That's the penitential spirituality by the way. The great commandment, continuous conversion. The third one that you, that you love, that you have in your work, is that of being leaven. And I see that as the word mother in the letter to the faithful. To be mother of the Lord. To give God birth by doing good. To give God birth by doing good. That's not an option. Once you're pregnant, you never will. Of course, we, we can't. You know, you're never a little bit pregnant, isn't that part of No such thing as a little bit pregnant. It's not an option. And the idea of the good example of our lives is really in the little things again. And it, it, okay, after having done the tavola, being a mother of the Lord, being leaven, is the multiplication of the loaves and the sharing of the grapes. There you go. We, we're good on visuals. We've got a visual now for the evangelical life. It isn't even the stigmata. It isn't, it isn't even uh, having your hair cut by Francis and being the first Franciscan woman. It was, the mul it, was, it was breaking bread for your sisters and, and sharing grapes with your brothers. Um, it's the key, the unconditional love of a mother. Most of us have, we're blessed with, with understanding that word. 
and it is un there doesn't compare or at least there's some, hopefully in all of our lives there's some one person that when we use the word unconditional their face is in front of us nothing was ever measured and, and sometimes it made no sense at all but it was never measured that's the mother that Francis and cer certainly Francis loved his own mother so he didn't use the word lightly and he certainly loved our lady that's also the key again about being open. I talked about the trip to the Sultan. But, you know, we don't have, we're not a judgmental. We, we want to try not to be a judgmental kind of people with regards to all races and all creeds, all status. I mean, nobody should be more comfortable, no matter what their job is or where they come from or who they are, than, than those who are with us. Or sexual preference. Not, there, shouldn't, there are no categories. It, the, 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 the continuous conversion call is to look into the eyes of the other and to try to know the other and to see the good. Basically, when we get extremely judgmental, there's a, there's a saying about we're always down on what we're not up on. So that's kind of an invitation to a little homework. We're always down on what we're not up on. Okay? So having said all that, um, I just wanted to, to sort of gift you with that in terms of who I am and who you are as we're all in this together. Um, yesterday, again, Mel stole some of my thunder. <laughs> he referred to Joan Chittister's book about the fire in the ashes, and that's another book I'd recommend, and I don't know who has it. But there's a chapter in here, and I'm sure this is what Mel was thinking of when he used Joan. She has a chapter called On the Way to a High Mountain. On the way to a high mountain. And sometimes Joan gets a little tedious in her, in her she's a sort of slogany, you know. But she's a good writer. I mean, she's got insights. Or she's also pretty angry sometimes. That, that's harder to take than the, t the, the slogans. But in this particular book, Fire in the Ashes, I think I have, I think it's the, it is this one. Yeah. She talks about being interviewed by the... Um, Prioress, when she enters, and they ask, you know, why are you coming? And it seems as though all the postulants in her time gave the wrong answer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm coming to do good deeds for God. I want to save the world. Now they were doing all their usual. I want to go out and and the, and the, and so the prioress was all over them about, you know, you're 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 you can all go now, or you're not here for the right reason. And what she wanted them to say was, they came because they were grasped by God. They, 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 they were here. Now, this is the Benedictine, okay? They, they, they were postulants, and sure, they were zealous, and sure, they were youthful and energetic, but she wanted them to say there is only one reason in all the world why anybody comes, and it comes because you are grasped by God, and what you are about is a life project of getting to know that God. And this is a recent book, okay? Somebody was daring to say you fell in love with God. So I, I just I share that with you. The others that I brought, because I was um, again, it was my favorite, one of my favorite topics. So I have favorite books besides my Franciscan things, which people think I can't think anything else but Franciscan, <laughs> but I can. There are a few other authors I know about. Demello is one. I don't go, uh, n n not all of his work, but it, well, I very much like this one, The Well Springs, and The Well Springs opens our eyes to the to the to the daily. I think there, there's some treasures in here that give us other ways. This, this goes with me everywhere. This, this goes with this is this in my Bible. Not even the rule. I take this in the Bible. This is the poetry of Jessica Powers. I can't recommend if you like poetry, Jessica Powers. It's it's edited by Bishop Robert Morneau, M O R N E A U. Robert. It's called the Selected Poetry of Jessica, J E S S I C A. Powers, P-O-W-E-R-S. Extraordinary. She's a Carmelite nun. She has died. Carmelite nun. Very close. The Carmelite, isn't that right, uh, Dominic, the Carmelite spirituality in ours? We have, yes. There's a lot of stories. Yeah. Although there's some heavy stuff in here that we're not quite, you know. Yeah, they're a little more, they're a little more. A little more negative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not... But, but Jessica, I'll give you I'll just quickly uh, one, just one, only one example, but just to hear her. It's called To Live with the Spirit. To live with the Spirit of God is to be a listener. It is to keep the vigil of mystery, earthless and still. One leans to catch the stirrings of the Spirit, strange as the winds will. The soul that walks where the wind of the Spirit blows turns like a wandering weather vane 
toward love. It may lament like Job or Jeremiah, echo the wounded heart, the mateless dove. It may rejoice in spaciousness of meadow that emulates the freedom of the sky. Always it walks in waylessness, unknowing. It has cast down forever from its hand the compass of the whither and the why. To live with the Spirit of God is to be a lover. It is becoming love. And like to him toward whom we strain with only the metaphors of creatures, fire sweep, water rush, winds whim. The soul is all activity, all silence. And though it surges Godward toward its goal, it holds as the moving earth holds the sleeping noonday, the peace that is the listening of the soul. To live with the Spirit of God is to be a listener and it is to be a lover. So anyway, those that like poetry, Jessica. Who's the publisher then? The publisher is Sheet and Ward. Every Bush is Burning is, is called A Spirituality for Our Times. It's by Joan P-U-L-S, a Franciscan. And the publisher of that is 23rd Publications. Uh, again, Joan Chittister, Wisdom Distilled in the Daily. Um, this, is, this is very, very fine. She takes the rule of Benedict. And even for the experience of the very close relationship between our charisms, I mean, Francis, you know, came out of the era of Benedict. This is very well done. Wisdom distilled in the daily. But it, it's, a, it's almost a commentary on the rule of Benedict. I'll leave them here, and then you can look at them um, in between. So, anyway, so that is what I wanted to share with you with regard to our own story together, our own images, but more than anything, our own desire to say thank you, day in, day out, and to know that even when we don't feel it, it still is very much indicative of an unconditional love because we've fallen in love, no matter how that feels some or how that takes. I have a prayer service that I'm going to leave. Um, there might be, even this afternoon, I know you're doing groups, it's just a little, um, just a one page thing. Uh, that, or you can take it home with you, might be even better that builds on the sense of it is our Lord God, it is our God whom we feel and whom we see, whom we touch. Um, the incarnational theology, the face of Christ, very, it's a reflection on the face of Christ. And it sort of ties this whole thing together. But again, in our, in our language and in our sources, and most of all in our, script, in our scriptures. So, thank you very much. Thank you.